Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. We talk with professionals who work across the span of content strategy, from small businesses to big enterprises, from content design to content marketing, from solo consultancies to huge agencies. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 35 of the Content Strategy Interviews podcast. Uh, This is the first episode of season number two of the podcast, and I'm really happy today to have with us John Seacrest. I know John as uh, like the most knowledgeable, generous, helpful person in the Seattle startup world, but I want to have him tell you a little bit more about himself. Hi. Um, I'm mostly focused on uh, economic development and doing economic development from a startup point of view, making uh, stronger startups that are more investable and then making more angel investors who do investment. So those are the two pistons that I work on. And both of those are programs that work around narrative and story. So when I have a startup and the startup is um, uh, two guys, a dog, and an idea, the only way they get funded is that they tell an effective story and then they live that story. And content strategy is essentially the management of the story. And there are a bunch of stories in the middle of investing, in the middle of startups, and in the middle of businesses that you need to be able to clearly articulate. Mm-hmm. And when you do, you make progress. And when you ignore that narrative, then you wallow in the swamp for years. Got it. You said the reason, the the way this whole interview came to be, we were chatting at uh, Techstars Startup Week last fall, and I asked you about content strategy in startups, and you said, not content strategy, content strategies in plural. And I gather from what you were just saying, there's sort of these different stages that startups go through, different different communication intents at different points in your development of a startup. Can you talk a little bit more about that, about how you go from one strategy to another, I guess, or how you develop those? So um, as you move a business from the guy and the dog and an idea to, uh, you know, 50 million or 100 million, or if if we're unicorn hunters, a billion dollar company, um, the strategies that are engaged with to... Um, manage the culture of the company, to manage the relationship of the components of the company, to manage the relationship between the customers and the company, to set the brand and define the brand. All of those things shift um, based on the size of the company. And you can see uh, places where culture and behavior of the company as they've grown from being the outlier to being the center um, have to functionally change and then when they haven't they get actually into legal trouble because they start you know acting like a startup when they're a monopoly um, you can go look at the history of Microsoft for several examples of that mm-hmm. and so the who are we where are we going why are we doing this are all foundations to any good narrative and uh, you can't build a culture without that and you can't build a loyal customer base without that and you can't survive stupid decisions in your company when uh, Mm -hmm. your customer base doesn't buy into your narrative. Um, And so how you talk about yourself and how you talk about your mission from God in the world is all vital and and that transformation as you grow becomes important. And you're seeing that now with Google and their, you know, do no evil thing is starting to rub them the wrong way because they're no longer a little tiny I read tiny that they thing. had actually removed that from their mission statement. Yeah. 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 So last week there was a post about um, them adjusting that that part of the mission mm-hmm. because it got, got them into trouble as they became a dominant player in the marketplace and then uh, every time they turned around, every negative consequence had some kind of, oh, but they said they weren't going to do evil thing and now it caused friction. So... Gotcha. Yeah. Um, direct result of building culture and then through that process, the culture not evolving 
based on the size and context of the company. Right. And that's their, well, they started kind of classic, two or three guys in a garage. And I think yeah, my two, hunch is... Two, two uh, Stanford grads and a professor kind of conversation. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so a lot, I think a lot of the people listening to this podcast are more in that stage of the game. And I think, and I'm assuming from what you've said, that a lot of this, the, that these content strategies kind of track, to, they track to the development of the startup. And like, as Eric Reese has said, there's that a startup is, is not a small enterprise, it's a different thing. And can you talk about that? So, and in, in Google is now an enterprise, and from that startup thing to an enterprise, talk, talk a little bit about how content figures into that. Well, so, journalists in general don't seem to understand how to do math, and they also don't seem to understand the word startup. And so, let's be pedantic about it a little bit and say, uh, Eric Reese, uh, following that thought, um, a startup is an organization which is searching for a business model. So this is straight out of the Steve Blank initial book in 2003. Mm -hmm. And so you're not a business yet. You're trying to figure out how to be a business. And, then, and you don't yet have clear customer, you don't have clear product, and you certainly can't predict your sales cycle. And so your goal is to seek a sales cycle where you get um, customer you know, market product fit, right, that product market fit uh, turning point where you can all of a sudden grow very rapidly because you've found a sweet spot and now everything goes. And now you're a real business and your ability to predict sales is uh, meaningful and now you can do the MBA, tune the engine so that it gets better and better. Mm -hmm. And before that point, the MBA tuning is, is disastrous, right? And so understanding the difference between a small business and an enterprise understanding the difference between a small business and a startup that is seeking to become a small business, which is a growth business. And so there's some overlapping pieces there, right? In the startup world, we're focused on the question of producing growth businesses that can have significant income or impact by getting big and serving a lot of people in some way. And, and the nominal angel investor goal in their mind is somewhere between 25 and 50 million is the place we would like to see a business get to. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, bigger than that uh, is everybody's nice, warm, fuzzy dream, but you know, good, solid, effect, solid, effective businesses that um, can produce a reasonable, predictable revenue and impact a large number of people is a win. And so then, what do I, as the two guys in the garage, have to do so that I can produce that $50 million? Well, that happens because I have a bunch of other people that come join me at this thing. And if I don't attract the right people, then the number one cause of companies failing is the team doesn't play nice together. Mm -hmm. And then the second uh, cause of companies failing is the market doesn't really care that you're doing this thing. And so... Right. You have to have a team that's willing to execute on the thing and, and row the boat in the right way, but you also have to be providing value and creating value to a customer base that's big enough that will engage with you. And both of those are things that have a narrative. And at least for me, I don't distinguish narrative from content. You know, mm -hmm. The narrative is at the root of that content. And then where and how you play it out in the different media is a, a tactical question. Um, but you have to understand what your narrative is, and, and that's both internally to the organization, for that organization to be capable of growing to be a $50 million business, or um, to your early adopter customers so that they build enough of the right conversation and story that you can get into the regular normal market. Right. I think for other things you've said, that's the most important conversation is the one with the customer because that's how you're going to validate your product hypotheses and, and just business idea in general. But you also mentioned in there a couple of other things like kind of alluded to recruiting, to culture building, mm -hmm. to, um, and you haven't said anything about it yet, but I'm also assuming that um, the investor pitching, you know, each of those has kind of a specific, I'm assuming, do you have like an, are you striving for an overarching uh, messaging architecture that then tailoring individual messages for like your recruiting pitches, your your uh, investor pitches, your um, uh, customer interaction. So, so doing a startup is an inherently stupid activity. Um, it's one of those things that takes lots and lots of time with lots and lots of opportunity to fail with uh, your finances at risk, your marriage at risk, your your mental health at risk. 
it's really a big undertaking. And, and so uh, it's not something to be done lightly. And in the process, if you don't know what the why of what you are doing is, um, you will end up having some difficulty. So there's some kind of, you know, in the tradition of the Blues Brothers, the, some kind of mission from God that you're trying to do. And because of that, you're able to draw people together. And at the core, that mission from God end up framing this, this core set of things that you're trying to do for all of those groups, for why the employees should join you, why your co-founders should join you, why the customers should be engaged with you, why the investors should help you, I'll lead back to whatever this uh, overarching why is for the business. And so um, there's a book about start with why or something like mm -hmm. that, that, that's a word. The Simon Sinek. Yes. Yeah, yes. I love. This. And so yeah. the, the, the what, how, why, triumvirate that that collection of thinking is fundamental to the narrative right and somewhere in the story you're going to point that direction now mm -hmm. interesting stories usually don't lead with the why and then you beat people over the head with the why oh for the whole story that's a boring story right and nobody wants to play with that and so there's people and there's uh, um, difficulties and there's resolutions to those difficulties and there's reasons why people engage from a relationship based conversation about things which the end result of that um, tells the why mm -hmm. and so um, there are, there's a guy named uh, uh, I don't know, Williams uh, he does the Wizard of Ads uh, stuff he does the Monday Monday morning memo. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm having a hard time remembering his first name right now. I'll uh, dig that up and put it in the show notes. Yeah. yeah. So um, Monday morning memo, you get this conversation every Monday morning, which is a little story, um, and it's and it's the foundation of essentially relationship based marketing, right? Telling a narrative and telling a story and building a relationship with people. And that's at the core of this whole narrative conversation. So I believe that at the beginning, at the genesis of a startup, there is a why. And at the core of that why is a narrative. And if you as a startup guy are all excited about some little corner of the technology and you haven't thought clearly enough about the why am I doing this for people thing other than it's a cool project and I'm going to build it and wouldn't it be really neat if we did that on Mars instead of here, that's, that's not so interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at um, Elon Musk again. And, and he's sort of an interesting guy from a tech point of view. He's you know definitely technically oriented, has lots of ideas, but he's really clear about his why, right? He's he's trying to save the planet, and he's trying to do that in a in a very important way, right? If we can't get um, so that we have fixed the climate problem, uh, let's get rid of all of the problems with these car and gas and heating things. And he's he's attacking something like eighty percent of the carbon production on the planet with his various companies, right? And, and if you can't do that, then plan B is to have DNA on another planet, right? So he's, he's got a distinct personal why about what he's trying to do. And, and when that works well for him, he attracts a bunch of high quality people all trying to row that boat in that direction. And so um, if he tells that story well from an investor point of view, then he gathers investment, which he's succeeded at doing very well. And if you look at his layout of his products, he's followed the lean customer development conversation that Steve Blank talked about. You know, get a small group of people, do a high price thing, prove that the that there's enough engagement there, use that to build momentum on the narrative, move your way down into the normal market. And now he's got all the problems that the MBAs love of how do you produce enough cars fast enough to meet the demand that you have, right? And he's he's way over from the Let's let's do the startup thing to the oh how do you run this big enterprise in a way that it's effective and it stays on the rails? Um, he he has fundamentally now has a need to change the narrative of the company um, to be able to manage that enterprise activity right the internal story at the company still can have the why 
but the narrative has to change because now it's about optimizing the ability to perform, not proving that it's possible. Mm-hmm. But his overarching why has not changed, and I, no, I never really thought about not that for before. any of those three companies. Exactly, yeah. And um, I'm trying to think of examples from his growth because I've, I've followed him kind of sporadically over the yeah. years. Um, has his message been clear? Has have you always sensed his why and felt? I have always sensed it, but yeah. he's very rarely said it directly out loud, right? He's always told the story that led to that, right? And so he's telling the interesting story in in this context, he's doing a reasonable job of doing that, right? Well, that's really interesting, because I think one of the, like, the dream of a lot of entrepreneurs, is, or many of them, is to be like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or somebody like that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's interesting that they have, that the, his why was clear to you, but like when I think of all the media coverage and the little, to the extent I followed it, I wasn't seeing that. But like, but they're, these guys... They're, they're all chasing the sausage getting made, not the, the message, which is the, yeah. the core of the content strategy. And that content strategy has to be loud enough that people can hear the message even over the noise of the journalist and what's the current you know piece of sausage fall- falling on the floor today, right? Mm-hmm. And wherever I'm at, the journalists are going to find a problem because that's how they sell their papers, right? Exactly. That they, they talk about a problem. And so you can't talk really about the successes very long. Um, you, you have to talk um, from the startup point of view about the greater mission from God. Yeah, that reminds me, I, I, you, when I was doing the research for our conversation, I came across a tweet that you, yeah, I think you retweeted uh, something about content strategy precedes customer development, the silent benefits of PR. Right. And is that sort of getting at that? And I couldn't, the, the link to that article is broken now, but I think it was a couple of years ago. But yeah. that's sort of what you're getting at there. Is the, um, and, yeah, at the very beginning, when you are trying to figure out what you're doing, you have to build an audience, right? You there are seven point whatever billion people in the world, all of them know nothing about you. You have to do something where some of them know about you and then you need to filter those that will never care from those that could potentially care from those that really need this thing right now. So in the very beginning, um, your goal is to attract people who urgently need their problem solved. And so if you can't find a hundred people that all raise their hand and say, oh my God, I have this problem, here's some money, solve it to me, solve it for me right now, you've got a fundamental business problem. Mm-hmm. You have to know where those people are. And that's a and, huge and difference. If you, if between, you can't find yeah. that group of people, all of the other stuff that you do is not useful. That's a huge difference from an established enterprise that has mailing lists and kind of knows what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, you know, you yeah. got, um, you yeah. know, Microsoft runs these accelerators and, and the number one value that I think that Microsoft brings is they've got this sales force that knows how to reach out to 250,000 people that all have that problem, right? And they can walk you in the door and make introductions and away you go. So their accelerators have great value when the, the startups align with the customer base of Microsoft. Um, and, uh, when Microsoft understands their worldview and they're able to then go engage their customers and do that customer development work, they have a really significant advantage over the startup who is, you know, off in outer space trying to figure out how to find a planet that's worth landing on, right? Right. And so uh, enterprises in general do not utilize that resource nearly as well as they need to. Interesting. So that could if you look at uh, mm-hmm. Unilever, I think that Unilever actually is pretty inventive about how they go about that process of engaging their customer base, and they're a little narrow on what they think their business is. But beyond that, mm-hmm. they do a good job of engaging their customer base. Right. And those, I'm just trying to think of, uh, like you just said, like accelerated programs or having access to like Microsoft Salesforce or something like that, a huge advantage Big deal. in finding those potential customers. But what are there like guerrilla ways for scrappy, like bootstrappy kind of startups to to um, find their people? Because as you said, like they're narrowing it down from the 7 billion to the 100 they're going to help you right now. Well, one of the, the simple answers is, you know, people like to complain on Reddit. And so if you can't find a theme on Reddit that's echoing the problem that you think you're solving, then from, from the point of view of B2C business, you don't have a business, right? There's got to be some place in the world where people are complaining about the process of whatever the problem is. You know, every time I open the store, I get punched in the nose. It's really a problem. 
whatever that is, someone on Reddit is saying it. Now, when you go to the you know machinist union that's making little tiny screws, uh, they're probably not on Reddit talking about their problems. And so there's industrial B2B B2B places where those conversations happen, um, but they're typically inside the industrial organizations, you know, the industry, industry association meetings or the publications associated mm -hmm. with it. But for B2C, um, there's several social media places where if you can't find the taste of the problem, um, you need to be talking about something else. Now, there's always a time in evolution of a company where the problem exists, there's inadequate awareness of the problem, and so there's not a market opportunity yet because the customer base is not prepared to recognize the problem. And there's that education opportunity there. And that's a great place for an enterprise to play the education game and to build a content strategy around that problem and build a market. And it's a terrible place for a startup because startups have no fat on their bones and they can't afford that six to 18 months of education of a marketplace, right? And so this is a place where a scrappy startup would find some other business in a related corner that pays now and then as a part of their content strategy talk about the problem on a, on a regular basis mm -hmm. and then build their capacity to go into that market later. And so when you're doing your content strategy, it's not only for the business that you are today, it's also for the business that you intend to be tomorrow. And so that's another place that you get to this content strategies so that you are driving some part of the what how the world is going to be better by doing this thing here and then how that sets you up to understand that there's another bigger problem that needs to be solved tomorrow and mm -hmm. then um, if you come join us on this journey you can be part of that right and it's that well, i'm thinking of this gadget i'm holding in my hand my yeah, iphone like when when those guys started apple what 40 years ago they weren't envisioning envisioning this but their relationship with their customers their access to technology and design and all that stuff made this possible but it also gets to that we didn't so know I, we needed this problem solved <laughs> you know this was so i, I yeah. disagree with that notion okay. that, that apple um invented the that phone right mm -hmm. so in 1982 i was working at hewlett packard and there was a designer doing a bunch of thought design work that we were doing and we had something that was very very close to that i worked in the calculator lab and so we had one it's you know maybe a half an inch longer and a half an inch narrower because we were um, obsessed with the pocket oh, the, at Hewlett Packard. Pocket protector pocket, shit. Yeah, yeah. The, po the pocket calculator was our thing and we worked on that question. So it was in the air. There were lots of companies working on this question mm -hmm. of, of how to do the proper touch screen, screen, touch screen based computing device that would be carrying messages and all of that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, we knew what the problems were. We were we were all working on solving those various problems. We already had solutions for those that were inadequate. That we knew what they were. You know, uh, maybe you're young enough that you never have to carry a pager, but pagers were uh, an an evil thing that most people don't ever want to have again. Um, I certainly was very happy when I sold my company and didn't have to carry a pager anymore. And so um, the. The needs were obvious and being talked about at that point when, when those were coming out. Now, the fact that they were able to do it with elegance and that they were able to drive the design value has has been the thing that's driven the, the core values for Apple for, mm -hmm. for some time, right? And without Steve Jobs driving that, that piece of it, they would have been another Dell kind of thing, right? Yeah. I guess that kind of goes back to the and you, what you just said about values. Reminds me of the relationship between your why and your values. That's got to be really a tight relationship. Mm. But um, is it? A, I'm just trying to think. Of, is it a chicken egg thing? You have this why, this vision you want to do, and then you articulate the values that drove that, or do you? Or do people come from? And and how does this get articulated as content? I don't, I don't think yeah. anybody you know uh, steps out of the door one day and has everything put together all all cleanly and neatly. Um, I think that there are ideas about how things go and that you need to polish them and work them and that mm -hmm. um, the simple abstracty values that you have at the beginning um, end up not being uh, clear and effective enough. 
um, and then they get honed down, and then they uh, end up having to morph because you are no longer a little guy, you're a big guy, and what was cute as a little four-year-old is no longer cute as a 42-year-old. So your voice kind of matures you along would, with your you, company. You would hope. One would hope, yes. Um, and so um, then your narrative has to adapt to the stage of life you're in, right? And we, we put up with teenagers doing certain things, and then when adults do those same things, we get more than a little annoyed with it. And that's true when companies do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Hey, just we're coming up on time. It goes always goes so fast. I'm always amazed. But yeah, yeah. I want to give you one last chance. You know, before we wrap, um, is there anything last, anything about content strategy or just in general uh, that's on your mind that you'd like to share with my folks? So for me, the the all of the problems of the world, whether it's poverty or women's education or climate change, those are all going to be solved because some startup built a growth engine that actually addressed the problem. They got paid for it, and because they got paid for it, they could do more of it. And as a result, they were able to deliver to seven point whatever billion or 10.3 billion people when we get done with this thing. Enough of a message that they changed the world, right? The, the amount of time it's gonna take for, our, for us to go from a carbon-based fuel to a non-carbon-based fuel is going to surprise everyone in the next 10 years. And it'll happen because some startup had a crazy idea and put money and energy into it. And so all of those things end up being influenced by the narrative and process of how you tell the story about it. But underlying it all, all of the actions that make the world a better place also align with that same question. Sweet. Well, thanks so much, John. This is great. I Thank feel you. Like we could, I, I want to hold out the option to maybe have you back because there's a gazillion yeah, other things. Glad to come back. Yeah. Glad to have a chat. Sweet. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with John as much as I did. You can find more information about John, a transcript of today's show, and some other info at my website. That's lsmedia.com. It's spelled E-L-L-E-S-S -S media.com. In the next episode, I'll talk with Jen Marie. She's an expert on brand copywriting and content strategy for small businesses. I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a rating, maybe even a review, at iTunes or your favorite podcast outlet. And of course, if you're not already a subscriber, I hope you'll add us at iTunes or your favorite podcast outlet. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.